next question. Uh, I guess we had to uh, finish on people. Uh, the people, uh, they are the one we spoke about, the one we have to convince, or the one we have to make allies with, or uh, also the people who are victims. Um, and for the last session, uh, we decided that it could be really great to welcome people who are really not behind their computers, as uh, Jacob mentioned, but people who are really on the ground, who can really testify and show and, and discuss with you about the, this very link between natural disaster and human disaster. So we're very, very pleased to welcome two uh, personalities from the ground. Um, I first invite Soon uh, Gundnis from the uh, Office of Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs, who's heading the Pacific um, office. Welcome, please. And um, the second invitee of this last session, thank you, sir, um, is Mr. Tui Fagalele, who's um, director of the National Disaster Management Office of the Fiji. Good morning. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. We uh, wanted to today to speak a bit about the experience from the Pacific in regards to uh, climate change induced uh, migration um, and relocations and displacement. Um, as you no doubt understand already, the, many of the Pacific countries are very much at the forefront uh, of not only climate change, but also of the impact on communities, uh, especially in low-lying Atoll countries, but also in, in coastal areas in general, um, facing uh, difficult choices about whether or not to stay and how to sustain their livelihoods going forward with the sea level rise. Um, and uh, this has, of course, been uh, uh, an issue that has come up several times uh, this week uh, through the Pacific delegations in general. Um, but uh, it's, of course, also something that is very much uh, on the agenda of different initiatives uh, that are emerging, uh, not uh, only because of its importance, but also because this is not just a Pacific uh, issue. It is and will become a global issue eventually when, um, when uh, sea levels rise and communities in other parts of the world uh, will be affected as well, especially, again, in the coastal areas. But uh, we wanted to... Uh, take the opportunity and the invitation uh, from the Earth to Paris to give a bit of a perspective from our neck of the world. Uh, that is very much my colleague and friend, Tui, because I'm from Denmark, but I'm based in the Pacific. Um, and, uh, and talk a bit about how we uh, see uh, the, the issue um, from our vantage point. Um, and also very much uh, like to hear from you if there are any things that you would like us to talk about, if there are questions that you have, um, and uh, we will do our best to answer them. So um, with that, I'll hand over to uh, Tui to start out uh, from the Pacific perspective, and then I'll compliment them, and hopefully we can get a discussion going uh, with you, um, or at least a conversation about uh, these issues. So again, thank you very much for being here, and, uh, and uh, we are very delighted to be part of this uh, event. Tui. Thank you, uh, Suni and Bulovinak, um, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, to share um, some of the issues that we have in the Pacific with regards to climate change. I will start off with the uh, uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade. This is very important for us and it's an issue that we have brought here to Paris to ensure the survivability of our future generations. Most of our uh, island countries are maritime in nature, uh, coastal, and, um, and because of that, uh, we are very vulnerable to, um, uh, to climate change. I might as well say here, uh, for the uh, 20 most vulnerable countries in the world, eight are from the Pacific. Um, and uh, Fiji is included in that eight. The, the top most vulnerable country in the world is actually Vanuatu. Vanuatu, as you have known, uh, in, um, in March this year, they had a, a Category 5 tropical cyclone that cost the country um, a little bit over 500 a million US dollars. This is a small economy, uh, Vanuatu. That alone costs more than 50% uh, of their GDP. Uh, this year, they're also going through a drought period, just like Fiji. They're also going through a drought period like a couple of other countries. The issues that we have in the region, in the Pacific region, are both, um, um, 
hydro hydromet hydromet hazards and all and also we have uh, uh, geotech hazards like uh, earthquake and tsunami so whichever way that you look at it the pacific are actually being impacted by uh, uh, events by disasters almost every year and because of that our vulnerability status is actually ex exacerbated before we could recover from uh, any event we are pounded again by another one uh, if i take the issue of vanuatu it will take you know almost 20 or more than 20 years for them to recover for what they have uh, been impounded with with tcpm in uh, in march this year because we are coastal countries uh, three of our uh, of our countries are actually uh, atoll in nature, uh, Kiribati, Fuan, Tuvalu, and also the Marshall Islands. For the Tongan, for Tonga, they are where their capital is in Nukolofa, uh, Tonga Tapu is actually an atoll uh, uh, island also. So amongst this, uh, uh, these four, together with the, the coastal communities that we have, it is important for us in the in the in the Pacific that we come over here to perish, to get that agreement to ensure that the 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade is, um, is maintained or reduced. This is our issue because beyond that, it will be some of our nations will go under. And uh, unfortunately, the situation we have right now, a bit of a difference is that Fiji, we have our relocation policy. If something happens, we will uh, 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 relocate. We have already relocated to communities. 45 have already been... Um, uh, earmarked for relocation. There are more than 800 that we have uh, identified through our vulnerability assessment that will need uh, to be relocated later on in the future. Some of our countries in the region, they are not willing to move at all. So if we go beyond the 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade, it means they will have to go under. So this is an issue that we bring here to Paris, the importance of maintaining the 1.5 uh, uh, degrees centigrade. For relocation, it is not a displacement. It is not the first that you are going through. Uh, many years ago, Fiji uh, actually accepted uh, um, uh, displacement uh, uh, from countries like uh, Tuvalu. It was uh, Alice Islands then and also Gilbert. Then now they have their own islands uh, in Fiji. In preparation towards the relocation for the future, we have already uh, identified a piece of land in Fiji in which uh, uh, we have uh, uh, sold to uh, Kiribati for them if they go under. Right now they use it for their food security, but if they go under, they can use it to come over to be part of uh, uh, Fiji. This, this is the, uh, um, the assistance that we are giving out because we are not hearing much from the um, uh, developed world in, in terms of uh, uh, not only uh, um, uh, maintaining or decreasing the 1.5 degrees, but also for relocation of our uh, uh, people in the, uh, in the Pacific. It is an issue that is real and it is an issue that is practical and it is an issue that we'd like to bring to the world here in Paris to ensure uh, the survivability of our future generation. I think I'll leave it there and uh, perhaps um, I'll answer questions when they come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chui. Maybe I can compliment um, with, a, with just a couple of things because <clears throat> within the Pacific, uh, a fair amount of research is now going on. There's just a, a study that came out recently from Naudo, Tuvalu uh, and Kiribati um, uh, interviewing communities at risk uh, and trying to understand how they see their future. And it was very interesting uh, to see that um, amongst uh, many, uh, if not nearly all of the uh, 6,000 or so community or uh, families that were interviewed, um, the uh, vast majority uh, would consider uh, migration um, if their livelihoods were threatened. Um, but number one, they were unclear about the means for migration uh, because it costs money. Um, and also, uh, it was very clear that there's a lot of uncertainty about what does that mean uh, if you have to migrate even within your own country. Uh, there has got to be uh, policy, there has got to be dialogue around uh, both preparing the communities that are being affected, uh, having to migrate, but also very much having to uh, engage the communities to where you do migrate. Um, and uh, I think we are, we are looking a little bit at a, at a void where this discussion increasingly has to take place, not for theoretical reasons, but for very real reasons. There are a number of communities, um, to uh, uh, paraphrase Anote Tong, the president of uh, Kiribati, for whom it's too late. Um, so we are not talking about if displacement happens because of climate change, but we are talking about when displacement happens because of climate change. And again, try to take the precautions by first of all having a conversation and having a dialogue 
at the uh, leadership and the policy level, but also engage the communities that are at threat. Um, I think what Fiji uh, has done uh, is uh, commendable in terms of looking ahead and saying, all right, well, uh, if co communities or when communities in Kiribati uh, are being affected or communities within Fiji, we need to have a framework for that. But Fiji is actually one of the very few countries in the world that does have that. So um, a clear message is that we have to start the conversation um, and we have to start it at a, at a serious level because it's, it's, it will happen. Um, and uh, it might happen slowly and starting with the Pacific Island countries, some of them are really only uh, two meters above sea level, but it will also happen in other countries uh, down the line. Um, and, and therefore, uh, the, the it's important for the people, uh, first and foremost, that they are consulted and that they are engaged. Um, so how to take that forward, of course, is uh, not in our hands entirely, but it is a very clear message that is uh, coming out. Um, also from communities that have experienced displacement, including the Banabans from the Gilbert Islands in Fiji, that said very clearly, if we were doing this again, we need to be consulted. That will make the experience uh, much better. So, I think um, that's it from our sort of introductory uh, remarks, but we are, of course, more than happy to take any questions that you may have. So, um, I don't know how this is moderated, but I'm happy to... It is moderated. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, ben Jervy from Good Magazine. Um, even uh, with uh, if, if we achieved a 1.5 degree long term goal in the actual negotiations, um, obviously there's still a lot of damage being done uh, at that at that temperature level. Um, what is available through the UNFCCC process? whether uh, with regards to a, a separate loss and damage framework or um, adaptation measures and financing, which can only get you so far, and, and what are the hopes and, and sort of best possible outcomes we could see on both adaptation and loss and damage? Okay, thank you. Um, it's important that we have this uh, Article 5 on uh, loss and damage anchored into the Paris Agreement. Uh, simply because of the uh, of the nature of uh, issues that I have already uh, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, perhaps on loss and damage is uh, for us in the Pacific it is real. This is the irreversible uh, loss that we have because of the sea level rise and how the the oceans that we you know always say is our asset, is our resources, is now coming to haunt us simply because of the sea level rise, and. Um, and, and based on that, we would like to see that uh, Article 5 with regards to loss and damage to be anchored as, a, uh, as part of the agreement, uh, the, the Paris Agreement, and to be separated from adaptation. Because these are two issues that are very close to each other, but they are different. Adaptation means that you can still do something about it. You can put up sea walls or maybe uh, other interventions that can uh, um, uh, reduce the, you know, the, 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 the coastal erosions and things like that. But for loss and damage, these are something that has gone beyond our control. It has um, uh, put us in an irreversible position that uh, it is important, therefore, that it should be anchored in the um, uh, Paris Agreement uh, separate from, uh, from adaptation. Thank you. Hi, uh, Dervla Gavin, Financial Times. Um, we ran a piece a few weeks ago on the rise of luxury resorts in Fiji. Um, and there's there's a huge amount of them. Is Fiji still very divided? Is there a side that doesn't want to, to know about climate change and is still kind of in the luxury market and wants to sort of leverage that? And then another side that, you know, is completely, you know, scared and and sort of on your side and wants to to do more about the environment is it is it something you've come across that there's a division in opinions in where fiji's at environmentally okay, i'll try to um answer your question if you're looking at it yeah because it, 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 i'm just interested because you know we came at it from from a completely different point of view where you know there's no kind of regard for you know climate problems or anything and uh, you know it's the rise of luxury resorts um and then it's, it's just really interesting to see this side of it so i'm just wondering is there is there a complete division in in where 
sentiment on where where Fiji lies and and kind of and at what risk what risk that it's at. Okay, um, Fiji is a developing country mm -hmm. uh, in the Pacific, one of the leading uh, uh, economy in the Pacific also. Uh, uh, for us, we have already established a policy uh, called the Green Growth uh, uh, Framework, and this Green Growth uh, Framework takes into consideration uh, um, land use, um, environmental uh, uh, issues that are actually affecting our country. This, this uh, uh, framework was actually um, policy was passed this year in um, uh, in June by our Prime Minister, and that is where we are working towards in, ter in terms of uh, uh, protecting our environment. I, I know that some of the, because as a developing nation would like to grow, there are issues of environment that will also come up. Uh, we have also taken uh, risk management uh, uh, very seriously, and uh, we are also uh, uh, moving along that line in terms of uh, uh, construction, in terms of uh, development that we make. We are trying to adhere to this build back better policy, uh, build back better principle that are being uh, 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 put forward by the Sendai framework and it's something that we have been trying to do for the past few years and more into the future. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Rides Barsha from the Philippines, writing for the Manila Times. My question is, what is the Fiji government is doing for mitigation and adaptation measures for the people to become resilient? And second, how many people you are relocating and when and where? Which country, in your mind, you are trying to relocate the people possibly affected by the sea level rise? Okay, the first one on, um, on, uh, on mitigation. Uh, we already have a small allocation in the uh, uh, Fiji national budget or yearly budget uh, that covers for both the disaster risk and also for, for climate change. Eh? Uh, it started last year and we're hoping that this allocation will grow into the years. This is how we, um, uh, we use uh, uh, projects to actually protect our coastal areas and also our uh, floodplains where people are being uh, uh, located. Uh, that has been in the pipeline, it has been going on, and uh, uh, as I have already mentioned of this triple uh, B, the Build Back Better policy, we are trying to ensure uh, that is also happening. Now, in terms of the uh, relocation, we are not relocating anywhere. Our issue here in Fiji is that the majority, uh, or quite a good number of the people in the rural areas are actually migrating to the uh, urban centers. Um, uh, uh, because of that, there has been a stress in the, you know, stress in the infrastructure, the economy, uh, in the main centers, and as a re and as a, uh, a, re a result of that, uh, uh, the climate change issues have sort of been, um, you know, ex exacerbated with us. Eh? Um, I think I leave it there. I hope I've answered your question. Did you mean, if I, if I may, were you also looking at, uh, at the people that are coming towards uh, Fiji for, for migration issues in terms of uh, disaster displaced or climate uh, change induced mobility from around the region? Because I do know that there are communities there, uh, migrants that are coming to Fiji, and I think Fiji, as we uh, heard now, has uh, already taken steps towards accommodating uh, um, people from around the region uh, who are facing this, uh, this particular uh, situation. So again, we, there are communities from Tuvalu, there are communities from Kiribati in Fiji already. Um, and you heard the other day uh, the Prime Minister of Fiji also uh, speaking directly to the President of Kiribati saying that uh, the Kiribati uh, people will never be homeless. Um, so again, I think there is of course uh, a solidarity there that has to be uh, looked at within the Pacific community, and I think it's very strong. Um, but I also think it's important that that solidarity is extended beyond uh, the Pacific itself, uh, given the limitations on, on, on resources in the, in the region, um, partly because of climate change. 
Um, and of course, that was uh, a message that has also come out quite clearly that the Pacific will go a long way to solve Pacific issues, but not everything can be solved within the uh, group of countries themselves. Okay, I have a question. I'm Nadim from Lead and CDKN. Uh, we know that weather-related disasters are on the rise and uh, countries from the Pacific are the most hit. Uh, so they, of course, they have to uh, respond to all those disasters. And uh, we have seen in, in recent past there has been donor fatigue, putting up money to the calls that has been made uh, to meet disaster uh, uh, catastrophe. Now, within this domain that where we have due to climate change, more and more disaster and less and less money coming in. So the countries from the Pacific, they have to use their own resources. Now, in the broader climate debate, they have put their eye in DC saying that, okay, we will mitigate this much from our domestic resources. But due to this rise in finances going to responding disaster, do you see any possibility that you may need to change your INDC or mitigation commitments considering that your lot of money to in the future will be spent on responding disasters. Okay, in terms of um, INDC, even though, I'll take Fiji for example, we have um, our commitment is 30%, eh? and out of that commitment we are now looking at perhaps looking at other areas that we were not covered, for example, uh, forest cover, uh, that we have, we focus more on our energy or energy output as the basis for the 30%. Uh, as a developing economy, the Pacific, as, as developing uh, economies, both development and also rehabilitation and reconstruction after uh, disaster events have to be t taken into consideration. The issue here is that we, we already do not have enough in terms of our budget for the development process. For us in Fiji, and I believe also some of the um, Country, uh, countries in the region. When we have humanitarian assistance, after that we are left to, uh, um, to do our own recovery and rehabilitation work. This is where the bulk of the funds are needed. Okay? And this is also where we would like to see more on climate financing in terms of this um, uh, cl uh, uh, climate change uh, issues. The, the issue that we have with us is that without any assistance coming in, one, our economy is, uh, is not growing. Okay, it's, um, it, it's moving backwards. The other issue is that because of the, the need uh, to actually do the work, we tend to reprioritize re on our capital uh, uh, budget uh, within the ministries, which means to say some of the programs that are supposed to be done this year will be pushed to next year, and some may not be done at all. And because of that, uh, and because of that our vulnerability tends to uh, exacerbate um, uh, because the kind of uh, disasters that we have in terms of hydromet and also for uh, uh, geotech, they are almost uh, year in, year out. So it, it's, quite a, it's quite an issue with us, it's quite a challenge, but we're trying to deal with it in our own way, even though if we have um, lesser commitments uh, from the climate financing, um, somehow, somewhere we'll have to deal with that. Thank you. May I compliment just for a second? I also think that uh, it's incumbent um, on the international community and international partners operating in the Pacific, be it the United Nations, NGO, civil society organizations, etc. So also really uh, understand how to use our efforts and uh, our investments better. Preparedness and disaster uh, risk reduction and mitigation uh, will always be more uh, economically uh, efficient than just disaster response. Uh, and therefore, I think, and I know that there's a strong push for this, um, for us to really uh, work under a much more resilience-oriented approach, uh, use our analysis, act, act on our analysis uh, for risk to make sure that we try to position ourselves and our work vis-a-vis -vis the uh, potentially affected community uh, so uh, or communities so that we can, we can be much stronger in preparedness. Um, again, I think uh, the calculation goes more or less $1 uh, uh, invested in preparedness saves about $7 in response. Um, response, of course, does tend to get much more attention and therefore also money is being thrown at it. Um, one of the conundrums I think that we are facing in the, uh, in the community uh, is how do we uh, make a convincing case for preparedness to make sure that there's investment in preparedness. We can come up with the data, but it is generally very uh, difficult to sell to donors and others a product that they haven't seen. 
Um, and uh, you will know that this is an ongoing debate, and I think the debate is, uh, is being strengthened uh, with the evidence that is coming forward. But we do still, I think, together, really need to work better uh, at, at preparedness uh, so that we can uh, mitigate the risks. Uh, of course, we cannot make the phenomenon or the events go away, but a disaster is very much a disaster because of the impact. If you can minimize the impact, then you can also uh, reduce uh, uh, the uh, suffering of the affected people. Any other questions you would have? Right. Uh, well, I think we've reached the, the end of this morning. Thank you very much for, for your presence and your intervention on that very, very central and key issues. Thanks a lot.